Hello and welcome. You're watching Global Insight with me, Oh Young. From Arirang News Centre in Seoul, we speak with experts from around the world to hear their views on issues making headlines. Now, all over the world, despite vaccination efforts, cases of COVID-19 continue to grow and thus are on the rise again, with the new Delta variant hitting over 104 countries. The World Health Organization expects this new variant to become the dominant COVID-19 strain circulating globally. And amid these concerns, there are a lot of questions and we connect with uh, world-renowned immunologist Peter C. Doherty, who was awarded the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine in 1996 to ask some of these questions. Now, an Australian immuno immunologist and professor at the University of Melbourne, Dr. P um, Dr. Peter C. Doherty's Nobel Prize winning research revealed how our immune systems recognize virally infected cells. Now, we welcome him back on our show. Dr. Doherty, it's so lovely to see you again. How are you today? I'm fine. Uh, always great to talk to you and friends in South Korea. Thank you so much. And well, we're really grateful to have you here. And actually, uh, from what I recall you saying last year, you were actually planning to um, retire last year and rather wind down your commitments at the um, Doherty yep. Institute. But since the pandemic broke out, scientists, governments all over the world, they've been knocking on your door. So, um, well, just for our viewers, I really want to hear what the last year of the pandemic has been like for you. Well, the last year of the pandemic has been very busy. As you know, we've had relatively few cases in Australia. I've uh, put my time into both acting as a discussant with my younger colleagues who are running the research labs. I'm no longer doing that at age 80 and into public communication. As I've been working on this type of uh, problem for over 50 years, I do have some some knowledge. So it's been um, kind of frustrating. We've locked down a number of times in Australia to control outbreaks. Uh, at the moment, we have um, a sig significant outbreak in Sydney to our north. And we've just found that some people have come to Melbourne in Victoria down in the south and they've uh, kicked it off again down here with the Delta variant. So we don't know where that will go because this virus, as you know, is very infectious. Well, I was glad to hear that you were vaccinated. And how was that? I mean, the person who was administrating the vaccine, did they know who you were? I mean, I, I would have been very nervous to be um, administering the shot to you. <laughs> we, uh, they, they showed up because we had a film crew uh, with us. There is a very fine documentary that's been made by the Australian filmmaker Sonia Pemberton, who seven years ago made a, made a wonderful documentary on vaccination called Jabbed. It's well worth seeing, and you might want to contact Sonia and, and, and air it if you have vaccine hesitancy, because it's a very good uh, documentary. But she's made a new documentary called Cracking COVID, which is around our institute. And she decided that I should be a kind of a character running through this narrative. It's just aired on the Australian Broadcasting Commission for an 8.30 time slot that normally gets 250,000 viewers, and I think you've got more than double that. And it will be up on online, of course, for people to view. I don't think you can view it in South Korea, but it is quite good, I think. Well, I believe it was available on um, ABC. It was released just a couple of days ago, actually, so something yes, to look uh, forward to. Uh, Tuesday night it was released, yes. Right, and well, that's an incredible amount of pressure on the person <laughs> administering the vaccine to you, sir. And well, um, yeah. since yeah. we spoke about a year ago for the first time, uh, fortunately, these vaccines, they have been developed and they are being administered in both our countries, yeah. Australia and South Korea. But the thing is, though, in both our countries, the vaccination process is going rather slowly compared to um, other countries. And there are these very worrying, uh, fast moving variants emerging. So, well, what I want to ask is whether that means the longer people are going to have to wait to get vaccinated, the less effective these vaccines might be. Uh, we hope not. I think the Delta variant is highly infectious. But my interpretation, my and this is, is, is an interpretation, is that it hasn't evolved as what we call an immune escape variant. It, it, it hasn't evolved because we've got antibodies out there from vaccination or from infection, and it's sort of changed to get past that. I think it's been evolving in countries where 
there is very low level of immunity and it's just come forward because it grows better and it transmits better. You know, viruses are totally inert particles. They're just a bit of genetic material with some protein and fat and carbohydrate around them as a sort of package. And, um, and all they want to do is grow and transmit. That's a whole uh, evolutionary strategy. So whether we'll get variants that grow better and transmit better than this one, I don't know. But I don't think it's an immune escape, it, even though it does, the, the vaccines are a bit less effective against this. Still, the AstraZeneca vaccines and the Pfizer vaccines, if you've had two shots of vaccine, they're protecting over 90% against hospitalization and severe disease. And that's really pretty fantastic. As an 80 year old, having had these two shots of the AstraZeneca vaccine, my risk profile is supposed to be that of a 50 year old. So it's, uh, the vaccines are great. They're really terrific vaccines, in fact. Exactly, we want to get those uh, hospitalisation cases down, especially in, well, the Delta variant has uh, now become the dominant strain in many countries. And But then yeah. there's now growing talk about the Lambda variant making its way around the world from South America. I mean, how do these new variants really affect our immune system, especially if you've already been vaccinated? I mean, do they... I, we haven't seen the Lambda variant in Australia at all. I'd be very surprised if the Lambda variant will take over from the Delta variant. I think the Delta's, Delta's more infectious, and I think the vaccines should handle it as well. But um, the, the vaccine manufacturers are, of course, making new vaccines against the variants, and I expect Delta must be a major target. That takes a while, but you shouldn't have to put these new vaccines that are using exactly the same technology through all that long trial process. It should be a pretty limited trial process, I expect. So they should be available. The main problem with vaccines, as we know, that's our problem in Australia, is supply. And I think South Korea is suffering a bit from the same. So I believe uh, uh, you, you, for instance, got some uh, vaccine from Israel recently. And well, there's been a lot of talk around Israel, as you probably know, um, that they vaccinated their population very quickly and they declared a return to masklessness and all these vaccine passes, um, yeah. cruise tours and etc. But it looks like uh, a growing number of people are getting infected, although they were uh, vaccinated. So uh, why is this so and how will that affect um, herd immunity goals? I, I, I didn't ever think that the vaccines would stop us getting infected. What I was hoping they'd stop us getting disease. And so you, you've got to think of it the way this works. Um, when we're talking about infected, we're talking about up here, up in the nose and, and that area. And we give the vaccine not into the nose, but into the arm. Now, if you really wanted to protect it up here, you'd have to have a vaccine you gave up there, which would give you more local immunity. But those vaccines generally don't work as well. So basically, it's very hard to keep enough immunity, enough antibody up here in the nose to stop you getting some infection in the nose. And that means people who are infected can transmit. They're transmitting at about 50% the rate, I think. But a lot of the severe disease, I think due to the fact that the virus gets around the body in the blood, and it's very easy. Vaccines that, that uh, are what we call systemic against viruses, what cause, cause systemic infections like measles or polio, where the virus gets around the body and the blood really work very well. And I think that's why this vaccine works so well, because I think it's stopping the bloodborne phase. We don't have that in influenza. And uh, so vac influenza vaccines don't work as well as this one. And do you think we're going to see more and more of these uh, strong mutations of the virus emerge? I mean, um, how and where do these very significant mutations of COVID-19 tend to occur? And more of it. Is there a way to stop them? Looks as though the Delta variant is taking over. So if um, if uh, we're going to see more mutations emerge uh, in essentially unvaccinated people, and the more unvaccinated people there are, and of course there are so many across the planet, uh, the more uh, more more um, possibility we have of such mutations emerging. But they have to do better than the Delta variant if they're going to take over. And, and I don't know how far the virus can go in doing better. 
I mean, it, it has to change its molecular self a little by mutation, which is a random process. And, and then, of course, just viruses get selected. So it has to do better than Delta if we're going to get further mutations that are of concern. On the other hand, uh, I think I'm wondering when it strikes an antibody of herd immunity, uh, a level of herd immunity, as is actually happening in the United Kingdom at the moment, uh, where you've got a lot of people vaccinated who are getting some infection. The question is whether we'll get immune escape mutants. Now, I doubt very much that any immune escape mutant will, will spread as well as Delta. And the reason for that is that I think the virus will pay a fitness cost. That is, to escape from that antibody control, it's going to have to change in ways it doesn't want to change with the due to spread, but change in ways it wants to do just to avoid the antibodies. Now, whether that will give us highly infectious variants, we really do not know. And uh, we're just waiting to see, quite frankly. I hope it doesn't, but, and I think there's a possibility it won't. And well, in your book in 2013, you wrote about how pandemics come about and how increased travel and globalization mean that they disseminate with incredible speed. And clearly not enough people listen the first time around, but how should we really prepare for the next pandemic? Well, I wasn't saying that alone. A lot of people were saying that, of course. It's just I wrote a little book, which is uh, kind of pandemics for dummies, basically. But um, Oxford University Press. But, uh, but really, I think... Uh, we are going to, we're going to be at, at, at risk of pandemics as long as we've got this massive global international air travel. You know, there were two coronaviruses circulating in human populations that we knew about, two common cold or croup coronaviruses uh, prior to the year 2000. Five have come across into the human population since 2000. Several things have changed, and I don't think the, 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 the incidence of these things jumping to humans has changed. I think probably this has been happening, particularly in regions of Asia, for a very long time, from bats to humans or bats to another species to humans. But I think what has changed dramatically is the amount of passenger international air travel and particularly the amount of passenger international air travel from China as the country has become more prosperous and from other Asian countries as they've become more prosperous, but particularly, I think, a risky are countries with live animal markets and live bird markets. We know that live bird markets are a massive threat with influenza. And Hong Kong, for instance, got to the point where birds coming into live bird markets would be left there for the day and then everything there killed out at the end of the night and sent to the supermarket uh, as packaged birds. So, so I think this is the risk factor. And that's what we need to deal with in the longer term as far as how we try to make uh, uh, better protocols for making sure that everyone's totally open about these outbreaks very early and, um, and that, um, the, uh, the, the, that we stop flying planes out of regions where these viruses are circulating. You know, there's, not, there's been a lot of talk about lab escapes and all the rest of it. I, I, I think that's irrelevant. I think what we're concerned with is viruses coming out of wildlife. There's no real evidence for a lab escape of this virus. Right, so really focus on what's um, out there and what's been proven and really um, learn those lessons in order to prepare for the future. And in terms of preparing for the future, you said recently um, in Nature that uh, when it comes to pandemics, climate change and so forth, we really have to grasp those fates that are shared by all people everywhere across the planet. So in mm. moving forward, how, how do you hope uh, human beings will really learn from this pandemic? Well, how we learn, well, I, I hope we'll learn a lot of lessons from this pandemic. I hope we'll learn lessons on not just the scientific front. We're certainly learning on the scientific front. My community, the science community, is totally evidence-based and we just look at evidence. Uh, sometimes we've modified our position on this virus as we've understood it better. Um, we, we've, we've been on a steep learning curve. And then there are a whole lot of lessons to learn, though, in terms of economics, uh, social sociology, social sciences, um, and uh, communication, many, many lessons to learn. Now, I hope we will, at the end of this, get academics particularly to look back and analyze all these parameters and see what we can incorporate in the way we do things that will improve 
uh, the, the, the prospects for the human future. Now, the, the pandemic is awful. Uh, it's been a horrible experience and it continues to be and will continue to be uh, for some time now in unvaccinated countries that can't afford lots of vaccine. But uh, climate change uh, is an infinitely worse problem because it's a constantly building problem. We can't make a vaccine against climate change. We can't shoot it or bomb it. I mean, we, we have to change our behavior and change the way we generate energy. And we all understand that, but that is a very difficult message because unlike the situation with, um, with COVID, there are very substantial, well-funded uh, groups who have an enormous investment in fossil fuels who will lie and, uh, and confuse. Well, this is where we'll have to leave the interview for today, but uh, that was Nobel Prize laureate and renowned immunologist and professor at the University of Melbourne, Peter C. Doherty. Thank you so much again for your insights. Uh, thank you, and it's, as always, been great talking to you.